Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast and good morning to everyone else. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for the final day of this special virtual education series from the National Lipid Association, Lipid Palooza, which is offered in celebration of National Cholesterol Education Month. The NLA would like to thank the sponsors of this series, uh, shown on the next slide. And my name is Bart Duell. I am a professor of medicine at Oregon Health and Science University, and I'm very pleased to be here today to speak to you about cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis. If you have any questions for me during this session, please submit them through the Q&A section on the right-hand side of your screen. I will address as many of these as I can at the end of our session. Before we get started, we have a brief uh, polling question and uh, go ahead and please respond now. Um, recommended treatments for cerebrotendin xanatomatosis include bile acid sequestrants, chenodeoxycholic acid, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, and fibric acid derivatives. And I think once everybody's done, great, thank you very much. So um, as I said, today I'm very happy to present a lecture on cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis. Uh, these are my disclosures, as you can see on the slide. And we'll go from here to the next slide. And I'd like to begin by presenting a clinical case of one of my patients. Um, he uh, came to see me initially as an eight-year-old boy who had been having declining health for the last five years. He'd had chronic diarrhea since infancy. He had normal development until the age of three years, but after that, started lagging behind his friends and was not doing as well as his older brothers. He specifically developed mild learning disabilities and abnormal gait, and these became worse over time as he got into grade school. He'd been evaluated by multiple consultants and no answer had really come to the parents. So at age seven, his vision was 20 over 30 bilaterally, um, not quite as good as expected by one year later, his vision had deteriorated to 20 over 250 on the right and 20 over 100 on the left. This led to identification of posterior uh, subcapsular cataracts bilaterally. Um, on his exam, he did not have tendons and thomas, but <clears throat> fortunately for the patient, we were in the process of a study um, screening kids with cataracts for CTX. So the combination of the cataracts and the history of diarrhea and developmental delay prompted testing for CTX. And lo and behold, his plasma cholesterol concentration was very high. It was 2.43 milligrams per deciliter. The diagnostic threshold for CTX is above one milligram per deciliter. And it turns out that average is about one-tenth of this level, it's around 0 0.25 milligrams per deciliter. We did not uh, check his urine uh, prior to a starting treatment, but within five to six weeks of starting treatment, his 23S pentol bile alcohol concentration was close to 10,000 nanograms per mil, uh, which was about 20 times the upper limit of normal. And just to confirm the diagnosis, we did genetic testing, which identified compound heterozygous mutations in the CYP27A1 gene, um, as indicated here. So treatment was initiated with chenodeoxycholic acid. So now you know the answer to the uh, first question. Uh, given at a dose of 250 milligrams per day in divided doses, and I'll say more later about uh, specific dosing, 
And um, over the coming months, his plasma cholesterol concentration came down to normal. His diarrhea diminished. He went from having four or more loose bowel movements per day to having one or two form bowel movements per day. Uh, gradually, his functional status and school performance improved. His gait and balance prefer, uh, improved, growth improved. And so now at the age of 12, four years later, he's actually doing very well. And this shows his growth curves. The, that's a little bit small for some of you, but the blue bars here indicate on his height and weight curves where treatment was started. And initially, he was down on the third percentile for both height and weight. And within over the first year, he started having a much steeper uh, growth curve for height and the same thing for his weight as well. The scale is uh, much looser on this slide. So at this point, he's doing great uh, growing normally. And this is a huge success that he, in a way, was quite fortunate to develop cataracts, which then, in his particular case, led to the diagnosis of CTX. So the presenting symptoms of CTX vary by the age of the patient, and they also vary uh, by the severity of the defect and how a particular patient responds. But in infancy, typical symptoms are uh, chronic diarrhea, which is very nonspecific, very common symptom in infancy. Failure to thrive is a little less common, but still quite common. Persistent hyperbilirubinemia can be an issue. Cataracts are seen in the majority of patients, as I'll show you in a little bit. They can have psychomotor retardation. And then because of damage to the cerebellum uh, resulting from the accumulation of cholesterol, they develop pyramidal and cerebellar signs as well. Moving on to adulthood, the in the untreated state, the symptoms become much worse. Um, dominated by neurologic dysfunction, uh, leading to ataxia and spasticity. If it's bad enough, patients become bedridden and uh, totally dependent on care. Intellectual disability occurs, dementia can occur. They can develop psychiatric symptoms that sometimes can overshadow everything else. So some patients end up getting uh, hospitalized for uh, sometimes permanently for psychiatric problems that can include behavioral changes, hallucinations, agitation, aggression, depression. Early cataracts um, often are present. Um, xanthomas tend to develop over time, both in the extensor tendons as well as in the brain, specifically the cerebellum, but not every patient develops these. As a a side effect of the disorder, premature atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease can occur. Chronic diarrhea sometimes persists into adulthood and seizures and osteoporosis can also develop. This slide summarizes, this is from Jerry Salen, uh, published a couple of years ago, um, summarizes in a nice way various symptoms on this scale, and then the age of the patient on this scale, this goes up to 40 to 50 years of age. Uh, so the, the what would be like the y-axis are the symptoms and age of onset on the x-axis. And you can see that uh, chronic diarrhea is seen in about 50% of patients. Uh, moving down, cataracts are seen in 88% of patients, uh, seizures in a third, Tendon xanthomas in about 70%. Um, foot deformities uh, actually uh, in one series uh, appeared in 100% of patients. And then moving down dementia, uh, once people get up to age uh, 30 to 50, dementia is pretty common um, occurring in 60 to 85% of patients. And the color scheme indicates a larger number of reports when the color is darker on this slide. So what is the biochemistry and what is the genetics? So this is a recessive disorder and it is caused by biallelic mutations in the enzyme CYP27A1, which is the gene uh, encoding the enzyme sterol 27 hydroxylase uh, one of the cytochrome P450 oxidase system. 
Defective CYP27A1 results in decreased bile acid synthesis and accumulation of cholesterol in plasma and other body tissues, including the brain. Xanthomas of tendons and the cerebellum develop, as I already indicated. And then it's a problem with abnormal sterile sensing that leads to accumulation of sterile and arterial wall cells and leads to the development of arteriosclerosis. The biochemical pathways are indicated here. And um, I am going to uh, draw on here. I don't have a pointer, unfortunately. But um, at this point where I've made the little arrow, can't draw it very well, uh, shows the initial step going from cholesterol to 27-hydroxycholesterol, which is defective in the absence of CYP27A1 activity. And then farther down here toward the terminal steps of bile acid synthesis, um, here the enzyme is modulating formation of kinodeoxycholic acid. And on the other side here, an alternate pathway forms cholic acid. So when the enzyme is defective uh, at this point right here, then the immediate precursor, um, which is cholesterol, accumulates in the blood. All of these other uh, metabolites accumulate as well. And it may actually be this particular one that passes into the brain. And then once it's in the brain is uh, converted by uh, both uh, brain cells and microphages and other cells into the cholesterol where it does the damage. And let me get rid of this. So among the physical findings, uh, this is the slide from the case I presented um, of the patient showing this hazy kind of speckled uh, cataract in the back of his uh, uh, eye and the back of his lens, I'm sorry. And this varies from one patient to another. Uh, sometimes this is a characteristic uh, pattern of cataract. In other cases, it's just merely a clouding of the lens of the eye. Tendon xanthomas were not present in my patient, but they can be quite dramatic. Um, this shows a large xanthoma in the Achilles tendons. Here are some on the elbows. They can be this size in the hands even, uh, be very dramatic. So in some cases, the patients who uh, progress into adulthood, this is one of the physical features that may bring the patient to attention. <clears throat> for those who are evaluated for neurologic abnormalities, um, MRI imaging can identify uh, these uh, hyperintensities that are seen on the uh, cerebellum um, marked by the arrows on the slide. And then I mentioned earlier, um, osteoporosis can occur. And this is actually my patient. And it's not clear whether this was osteoporotic or not. Um, he does not seem to have osteoporosis. But perhaps what happened is uh, because of his ataxia, um, shortly after he started treatment, he uh, took a jump and landed uh, on his uh, femur, his left femur is indicated here and develop this uh, spiral fracture. Um, treatment presumably stabilizes the bones. There's one report that it doesn't help, but another indicates that um, simply treating with kinodeoxycholic acid can normalize bone uh, development and bone health. Um, this, as a side note, I'll say, does not seem to be as a consequence of abnormalities in calcium levels or vitamin D levels. Uh, exact mechanism is not clear. <clears throat> Recently, uh, we published a case series of 43 uh, cases of CTX. And uh, the summary, I think, is helpful. Um, number one, that the mean age of diagnosis was 32 years. Um, essential take home point from my whole lecture is that early diagnosis and early treatment is essential to preserve uh, function, particularly neurologic function in these patients. So a mean age of diagnosis of 32 years is terrible. 
Um, 53% had chronic diarrhea, 74% had cognitive impairment, 70% uh, had uh, childhood onset cataracts, 77% had tendons anthomas. So not all had them, but the majority did. 81% had neurologic disease, and then 7% had early onset ASCVD. The prevalence is um, on the one hand rare, but surprisingly common. It's about three to five per 100,000 individuals worldwide. It's more common among certain groups, such as the Jew, the Druze and Sephardic Jews. Um, among the Druze, the prevalence may actually be as high as about 0.2%. Um, Ernie Schaefer uh, recently did an analysis of more than 200,000 subjects who were initially screened, so they did not have cytostrolemia or familial hypercholesterolemia. And um, the rate of cholesterol elevation above one milligram per deciliter was 3.4 per uh, 100,000 individuals. And then a recent study was published of which we were a part in which uh, uh, individuals with childhood onset cataracts, uh, no other screening, just childhood onset cataracts were screened. And three out of 170, 1.8% were identified to have CTX which was a 500-fold uh, increase in prevalence of CTX, indicating that at least screening kids with bilateral idiopathic cataracts for CTX is a notable and uh, reasonable strategy for trying to diagnose CTX early. Um, the diagnosis is established by primarily by measuring elevated plasma cholesterol levels, um, elevated urinary bile alcohol levels can be measured as uh, we did in uh, this, my particular patient. The uh, levels of this uh, complicated name that gets uh, referred to as 7-alpha, 12-alpha C4 can be readily measured in dried blood spots. So this opens the possibility to uh, newborn screening um, or mailed in samples uh, from around the world. And then to confirm the diagnosis, uh, looking at the CYP27A1 genotype is a thing that's commonly done. The treatment is specifically chemodeoxycholic acid at a dose of 200, 250 milligrams TID in adults and a weight-based dose of 5 milligrams per kilogram TID in kids. Um, there are reports suggesting that cholic acid can be used, but it does not work well for specifically the neurologic complications. And um, as a side note, I'll tell you it's uh, greatly ironic, but um, chemodeoxycholic acid is still not specifically FDA approved for treatment of uh, CTX, but it is the standard of care. Um, early treatment is very important uh, it's important to also know that reversal of the neurologic disease may be very limited. So that is why it's important to start the treatment um, uh, before patients have major complications in that regard. So in summary, uh, the cause of CTX is by allelic mutations in the, in the gene for uh, CYP27A1. The consequences include decreased levels of bile acids in the gut, which contributes to the diarrhea and malabsorption. Cholesterol accumulates in all tissues in the body, causing progressive debilitating neurologic dysfunction, xanthomas of the tendons and the cerebellum, diarrhea, cataracts, uh, which can be used as a possible uh, sign for early diagnosis of CTX, and then in the untreated state, osteoporosis and arteriosclerosis can occur, um, presumably being on treatment uh, normalizes the risk of osteoporosis. And the risk for atherosclerosis is a little less clear, but um, management of traditional risk factors is important in these patients. 
I did not show you the data earlier, but the uh, lipid profile results, uh, specifically the LDL cholesterol level, uh, tend to be normal in these patients. And then the final key point is that early diagnosis and treatment is essential, um, which is a little bit of a daunting task, but it's something that all of us need to do our best to complete. So um, with that, um, we'll move on to the next step. I really appreciate your attention and I hope you've uh, enjoyed this information in this short lecture. Um, before I take some questions from the audience, um, we want to conduct another poll to see if there have been any changes in uh, knowledge. So the polling questions are up and we'll give you a few moments to respond. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I'll, the, I cannot show you the poll answers, but um, <clears throat> the, uh, the pre-quiz uh, showed that 57% of you identified kinodeoxycholic acid as the correct answer. And post-quiz, that went up to 95%. So I think that's an excellent improvement, uh, nearly doubled uh, the rate who gave the right answer. And then... Um, Statins were thrown in there. That's a little bit of a trick question in a way because the um, statins are used in some cases to try to lower the LDL cholesterol concentration, but that is not a, a specific treatment for CTX. Okay, so um, there, there are a couple of questions here. The um, first one is asking about what to do during pregnancy. So pregnancy and uh, breastfeeding. The, there's some worry that um, the OBGYN doctors will have that we should stop all treatment uh, during pregnancy and breastfeeding. But the standard of care is to continue treatment because if you stop the kinodeoxycholic acid, then all the biochemical abnormalities come back. So it's not proven to be safe during pregnancy, but nonetheless, it, it is what's believed to be the right thing to do. Um, here's a, another uh, question about the diarrhea and whether it's specifically caused by a decrease in the amount of bile acids and whether there are uh, special dietary recommendations, such as a low-fat diet for these patients. Um, so the diarrhea is really a consequence of the deficiency of bile acids. And for that reason, the specific treatment is simply giving back bile acids, which is accomplished by giving kinodeoxycholic acid. Um, the dietary recommendations, therefore, aren't necessary specifically for treatment of the CTX, um, but for healthy living, then we uh, give general advice in that regard. There's another question about the mechanism for the effect of kinodeoxycholic acid in the treatment. And basically, as you saw in that biochemical pathway, a kinodeoxycholic acid is the immediate uh, precursor of the CYP27A1 enzyme. And by giving kinodeoxycholic acid, two things are accomplished. One is it gives the patient a full supply of bile acids to facilitate the dietary fat and uh, lipid absorption. But the second thing it does is by feedback inhibition, shut off or at least attenuate production of bile acids and thereby attenuate production of excess amounts of cholesterol and the other uh, harmful metabolites. Um, the next question here 
is um, any suggestions for treatment of a patient with progressive xanthomas on maximal kinodeoxycholic acid therapy? And that's a, a really excellent question, and there's not a specific answer for that. But um, the, there's a lot of discussion these days about what the best marker is for adequacy of treatment. And there are patients in whom the plasma cholesterol concentration is normalized, but other measures of the abnormalities, biochemical abnormalities, such as the urinary bile alcohol excretion can still be very high, 20 times normal. So those particular cases would suggest that perhaps the treatment is inadequate and um, perhaps our, our idea of the dose, standard dose being 250 milligrams uh, TID is not enough. So in a patient like this who has progression um, and it's clear that the xanthomas are not a response to chronic injury or some other process, then um, perhaps a consideration of uh, very carefully trying a slightly higher dose of kinodeoxycholic acid with monitoring of urinary bile alcohols might be worth doing. Um, and let me see here. I think um, these are all the main questions at this point. Um, any other questions that people have? Um, while people are thinking, I'll, I'll throw out that um, the case I presented as a, a child, of course, and so many of you might think you only see adults, so you'll never have to think about this, but I want to remind you that in our survey of the 43 cases, the mean age of diagnosis was um, uh, well into the uh, fourth decade. So what this means is some of these patients just progressively get worse and maybe will come to attention specifically because of their tendons and thomas. So um, what it means uh, to me is that every lipid specialist really needs to be on the lookout for this disorder. And the tip off will be that uh, in your evaluation of the tendons and uh, in this patient who is getting more demented and having trouble walking, that they will not have severe hypercholesterolemia and they will not have cytosterolemia, which could uh, of course, cause uh, uh, tendon xanthomas. So that should prompt you to do the biochemical testing uh, for plasma cholesterol and probably looking at urinary bile alcohol levels as well. Um, somebody's asking me to mention the case very quickly. Um, the, the case basically was of a young boy who developed normally until age three, and then over the following five years, progressively worsened. Um, developmentally was doing worse, uh, physically doing worse, um, had chronic diarrhea, developed some ataxia imbalance, uh, trouble running. And the thing that brought him to attention was the development of bilateral cataracts, which um, prompted testing for uh, CTX and identified uh, high levels of both uh, cholesterol in the plasma and elevated levels of bile alcohols in his urine. And he went on treatment. Uh, he normalized. He's now doing outstanding uh, four years later. In fact, I... Uh, saw him just a couple of days ago. Um, so um, we have another minute or so for another short question, perhaps. Um, I, we have, I believe, a hard stop right at 9.30, which, um, or I'm sorry, 12.30 Eastern time 
I'm on the West Coast, so it's still 9.30 in the morning here. Um, well, uh, before we go, I want to thank you again for joining the Lipid Palooza and joining for my lecture on cerebrotendinous anthomatosis. I want to encourage you to tune back in in another 15 minutes at 12.45 uh, p.m. Eastern Time, which is 9.45 Pacific Time. Uh, for a session on bimpedoic acid that will be presented by Dr. Jamie Underberg. Um, uh, let's see, quick question, uh, two questions before we go. Um, how high does the LDL cholesterol level go? Um, it tends to be low in most of these patients, um, uh, below 100 often, 100 milligrams per deciliter. And another question is whether this is well recognized among ophthalmologists. I think it's variable. Um, the, the, the ones who are tuned into this are outstanding at it, probably better than us um, at doing the screening. And others um, may not be tuned into this. Well, I think uh, we are at um, 1231 Eastern time. So I believe it's time for us to end the session. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Thank you for your great questions. And um, I'm uh, looking forward to the rest of the day. And I hope all of you are able to participate. So thanks again.